Welcome to Wisła in Poland. We're here at the annual conference of the European Leadership Forum, which is a coalition of evangelical Christian groups seeking to do what no single organization could do alone, provide a bridge between God's global resources and local leaders from all over Europe. I'm joined by Lord Mackay of Clash Fern. Appointed to the Faculty of Advocates in 1955, James Mackay was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1965 and Lord Advocate in 1979. He was appointed Lord Chancellor, Chief Justice, Head of the Judiciary and Cabinet Minister by British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in 1987 and continued in this office under John Major until 1997. He is patron of the Lawyers Christian Fellowship, having succeeded Lord Denning. Lord Mackay is addressing the European Politics and Society Network of this conference, and in particular, the topic of equality in law. Lord Mackay, welcome to what we're calling the studio. And uh, you have had a, a prolific career from a most observer's perspective, and it, you came from very humble origins. Did, did it surprise you that you reached the high, one of the highest offices in the land? Well, it was very surprising. Um, I, I was in a modest home, but very pleasant. Uh, everything we needed, we had, and uh, uh, I think we had quite a lot of contentment. And some of your recollections from family life and from your Christian life? Well, my family life it was very interesting. I was an only child. Uh, my uh, father came from Sutherland, and Clash Fern in my title is his home where he was born, uh, in the west of Sutherland. And uh, my mother came from Caithness, uh, and they had family. My mother had quite a substantial family in Caithness, and in school holidays we uh, were together with uh, seven cousins there. So I think my social schools such as they are were greatly improved by having to uh, have the fellowship of cousins. We were very much subject to uh, the um, church. The church was uh, a very important part of our lives, uh, both uh, in my cousin's case and in my own case. My father and mother were very um, loyal to the church uh, and uh, we attended regularly and uh, tried to put into practice the principles of the church. And as you went through your education, at what point did you see th that you were moving towards a career in the legal profession? Well, I started off in mathematics. Uh, I was a mathematician. Uh, I um, uh, studied in Edinburgh University and got uh, a degree in mathematics and what they called natural philosophy then, which uh, is another, an older name for physics with Max Born, Professor Max Born as the professor in, in natural philosophy, uh, and uh, Professor Sir Edmund Whitaker as the professor of mathematics. And I was very, very uh, interested in mathematics, and I got a good degree, and I got a scholarship to Trinity College, Cambridge, a major scholarship to Trinity College, Cambridge. But by the time I finished, which was 1948, uh, national service was required. Uh, and I was called with another colleague to the Joint Recruiting Board and they told us that there were vacancies which were needing to be filled in mathematics lectureships in the universities in Scotland and we were to apply for these and if we got them uh, that would be our national service and our taking up of our scholarships because my colleague had one as well uh, were to be postponed for two years. So I taught uh, mathematics in St Andrews University uh, the United College of St. Salvators and St. Leonard's uh, for two years. Uh, and then I went to Trinity and I took the mathematical tripos. Uh, and uh, by the time I had done that, I began to wonder whether a career in academic mathematics was quite the right thing for me. Uh, one of my colleagues in the class in Cambridge was Sir Michael Atiyah, uh, who became uh, later acknowledged as I think the best, or certainly one of the best mathematicians of the world in his generation. So I knew that uh, the competition in that area was pretty strong, uh, and so I decided that uh, I would come back to Edinburgh uh, and uh, try to get a degree in law, uh, which I did, and then as you said, I became a member of the Faculty of Advocates, 
1955. And uh, how, how did you find the, the challenges as a Christian um, growing up and going through academia? Well, I think that uh, obviously one's Christian views were tested. Uh, I used to go in St. Andrews, which was a small university when I was there, you could go to other uh, you know, clubs and uh, societies and so on. So I used to go to the Philosophy Society and also to the Divinity, some of the Divinity uh, Society meetings. And I got to know the Divinity professors there at the time uh, quite well. Uh, and uh, obviously there were a lot of challenges. There's one challenge that comes to mind just at the moment. I was in uh, lodgings with uh, undergraduate students who were Divinity students one of them since last sadly passed away, but the other is still a minister in a parish in Dumfrieshire. Uh, and on the radio, they had a program about Noah's Ark. And I remember the, one of the, the students saying to me, Mac, they called me, Mac, it must have been just like that. You know, they had all the sort of boorings and whatnot. Uh, and I think it was, that kind of thing was quite a challenge. Uh, but uh, anyway, I... Uh, adhered to the principles that I had uh, been brought up with uh, and I believe that they are reliable and I have uh, sought to live by them ever since. And then you moved into public service. Would you say that the challenges of being a Christian increased or it's just the same challenges or how would you describe that? Well, I think that? they're different but uh, whether they're any greater or less I wouldn't say. I think they're much the same. Uh, you have to uh, try to live according to your principles, uh, whatever the challenges you may face. And one of the principles which I sought to live by was seeking for guidance and help day by day. Uh, it was very precious to me that the scripture said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. I'm using the King James Version, so the words are slightly old. Uh, upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. And I must say, I found that uh, promise something that one could rely on. When I asked for that wisdom, it, the, the results were usually better than if I tried to do the thing myself. And we uh, have quite a robust legal system in, in the UK, but uh, being a public servant implies that you're, you serve that system. Um, were there any occasions where, where you thought, well, the system is wrong and as, as a Christian I, I, I should bide my time or I, 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 I'm in a position of leadership, I can challenge what's well, wrong? I, uh, when I came to be the Lord Chancellor, uh, it was pretty obvious that there were matters in the system uh, that required consideration. Uh, for example, between the bar and the uh, solicitors, there was an argument about whether solicitors should have rights of audience in the Supreme Courts of England and Wales. Same applied in Scotland, but I'm concentrating on England and Wales for the time being. Now, the uh, uh, Bar and the Law Society set up a committee under an independent chairwoman uh, to examine this with five barristers, five solicitors and five independents. At the same time, the government felt that uh, the uh, matter should be resolved, uh, but uh, they were willing to wait until the committee had reported before taking any action themselves, because I certainly thought that that was the wise thing to do. Uh, if someone else is prepared to get the changes made that you think are necessary, it's probably better to let them get on with it. So the committee sat and eventually they decided 10 to 5 that uh, the solicitor should have uh, rights of audience in the Supreme Courts. Uh, now, the five were the barristers. They had uh, voted against, but obviously the committee um, as a whole uh, thought it was right, uh, and in particular the independent members thought it was right. So um, eventually I introduced uh, green papers about changes to the system, not only for uh, the, um, the question of uh, rights of audience, but other aspects as well. And indeed, some of these aspects are only now being put into effect, but they were raised in uh, green papers 
1989 uh, and uh, eventually after a good deal of uh, interesting comment from a lot of people uh, they were given effect to. And um, you, your positions, Lord Advocate in Scotland, Lord Chancellor of the United Kingdom, uh, are traditionally and have been in history positions occupied by churchmen, a and if that's an accurate thing to say, and you have um, you have some going back hundreds and hundreds of years. So at what point do you decide? Well, um, we must hold to the tradition, or or we must. Um, revise. Uh, I think that uh, particularly the Lord Chancellorship was uh, held by uh, clerics uh, in the early days. As you know, the Lord, as you just said, the Lord Chancellorship was a very old office uh, dating from well before the Norman Conquest. Uh, the Lord Advocate's uh, position wasn't so clearly pl um, clerical. It was really a, p a legal position. Uh, I would say, but the Lord Chancellor certainly was until um, more modern times when uh, the lawyers took over uh, from the uh, uh, priests. Uh, and uh, by the time I had come on the scene, of course, it was purely legal uh, position, but with responsibilities in connection with the established church, such as the appointment of or the nomination of priests uh, in. Um, quite a number of parishes in England and some other ecclesiastical offices also. But these matters were handled by the ecclesiastical secretary uh, to the Prime Minister in Downing Street. And so the, although the responsibility was the ministerial one of the Lord Chancellor, uh, he had help and very, very considerable and wise help from the ecclesiastical secretary. And the policy that I had was that the people chose the priest, and it's amazing how well that worked. I had only one complaint, I think I'm right in saying, during all the time I was Lord Chancellor in connection with this part of my job, and that was that an appointment in a particular parish was being a bit slow. They weren't getting an appointment, they were feeling it's a bit long. Well, the reason was that they couldn't agree uh, on whom they wanted, and shortly after the complaint was made, uh, they managed to reach agreement and an appointment was made. And do, do you, or did you, uh, take inspiration uh, from any uh, of your predecessors, such well, as Thomas More? Or yeah, well, I, uh, of course, uh, knew about them, uh, and uh, I took inspiration from my immediate predecessors as well. Uh, and uh, it was always interesting to see how they'd done. Every, every era has its own requirements, uh, and I had to try to meet the requirements of my era, which were somewhat different from what had uh, been required in some of the uh, times gone before. And if you hadn't been Lord Chancellor, and even if you hadn't had a legal career, what do you think you could have done or, or you would like to have done? Well, I think I might have uh, stayed in mathematics. I'm not sure. I, I, I've never really thought about that because once I changed over, uh, I did my best to make a a go of it, uh, and uh, I haven't actually thought of anything much else um, in, in the sense of a career. Uh, I've uh, had opportunities since I retired uh, to take part in uh, constitutional inquiries in other countries, for example in uh, Mauritius and in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, but these were really aspects of um, a legal career, and I never fancied doing anything else. In, in the, the sort of modern times there's been an explosion of legislation which must have made life extremely busy when, when you were in office. How did you, how did you manage your time? In a tip, or was there a typical week? Well, a typical week was pretty full, I must say. Uh, and uh, the demands of the office, apart from legislation altogether, just the, the demands of the office and the uh, role you had in connection with the judiciary uh, was uh, an important one and uh, uh, doing my best to steer the judiciary along and help the judges so far as I reasonably could, all of that was very important. One of the great changes that came shortly after I was appointed 
was in relation to whether judgment, judges could speak to the media. They used to have to require the consent of the Lord Chancellor. Well, I didn't think that was right. I felt that if people were judges, they should know themselves what they should do. On the other hand, they might need help from people who knew about how to deal with the press and so on, and we tried to provide that for them, but they were given the responsibility of uh, speaking to the press if they thought it was right to do so. Uh, and on the whole, I think that has worked extremely well. Uh, and most judges that have spoken to the press have spoken wisely and well and in a way that has been useful in the public interest. Um, as you've mentioned, the, the media and, and the press, it, that, that has been the phenomenon of our time, uh, you know, a media involvement. And, and through, without getting involved in too much detailed politics, through your career, do you find that the, the, the legal profession has been able to maintain its standards and not been um, uh, influenced by you know, media intrusion? America has had much more intense media intrusion, but the UK not so much. Well, uh, we've had quite a lot of media um, involvement, I would say, perhaps. Uh, and obviously, the media are very interested in judgment, some judgments and so on. There's been a pretty big pressure from time to time to get the television into the courts. And in Scotland, an experiment, quite a big experiment was done to that effect. And we showed the results of it in England and the English uh, judiciary and uh, bar and uh, solicitors, I think, were not very keen, but it's coming back again. Uh, and it, as it happens, these things uh, come forward uh, again and again. Uh, I think that um, my, my uh, relationship with the media as Lord Chancellor uh, was really on the whole uh, pretty good. Uh, I said at the beginning when I was uh, appointed first that I would tell them what I, ha what I could tell them and not otherwise and I was willing to tell it to anybody that wanted to, to ask me about it. And I think that uh, was, a, as it turned out, was the right policy. And I think the journalists working in the area of the Lord Chancellor's responsibilities uh, came to quite uh, agree with that. Just coming back to your busy life, how did you manage alongside family life? How did you get the work-life balance? Well, difficult to do that. We, we did our best and, uh, yeah, of course, our children were grown up, really, by the time I became Lord Chancellor. Um, and. Uh, the uh, youngest was just starting university in Edinburgh, uh, so they were all grown up. And then the grandchildren were there by the time I uh, became Lord Chancellor, and it was very interesting for them to get the chance to see the inside of Parliament and the Lord Chancellor's residence as it was then. And, and uh, it was, I think it's something that they will carry with them for all their days. And just looking at the, the political aspect of the role of um, Lord Chancellor or Lord Advocate, it's, I, I understand it's a requirement or, or not necessarily, or, or is it more likely that you're going to be appointed a Lord Chancellor if you're a member of a political party? Well, I think the, the, it's, a, it's a political appointment. Uh, and um, uh, by the time I was appointed Lord Chancellor, I was a judge. So I wasn't nominally uh, a member of the party in the sense in which one ordinarily would be. Uh, your private opinions are matters for yourself when you're a judge, but you're certainly not expected as a judge, serving professional judge, uh, to um, uh, be active in, in a party. Uh, I um, Therefore, when I became Lord Chancellor, uh, it was of course a, p a political appointment and I was uh, a member of the Conservative administration. Uh, one of uh, the observations made about the office when I was Lord Chancellor was by uh, Sir John Major, then the Prime Minister. And uh, I remember him saying that he didn't wish the Lord Chancellor to be involved in the nitty gritty of party politics. And that suited me admirably. And I think I can say that I've uh, maintained that position, generally speaking, uh, ever since in my activities in the House of Lords. Um, a general view of, of the, the way legislation is devised and, um, and 
published and then ena enacted from a position of the Lord Chancellor's office and the, 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 the legal side. Um, were, were you asked um, to be um, for, for opinions from a legal perspective or from the... Uh, w without going into details around the cabinet table, uh, where, was there, there a respect for the legal position? There was, a, I think, very considerable respect for the legal position and the judiciary when I was serving in the cabinet. The Lord Chancellor's position is not to be a legal advisor to the government. He is not the legal advisor, and he was not. Uh, in my time, or that would before, be the Attorney General. The legal advisor. The Attorney General is the legal advisor. The Lord Chancellor's job was to see if matters came before the Cabinet that required legal advice, that it was taken. Uh, and uh, that was an important part of my role. But I always uh, refrained from giving advice of my own, except in relation to saying that something needs to be considered. Uh, and uh, that would normally carry a reasonable amount of weight and it would be considered and the Attorney General would have the opportunity of giving his advice, if necessary taking other counsel's advice uh, as part of uh, his formulation of his advice to the government. Uh, so there was respect for the, uh, the legal opinion but the, um, the sort of, I'm no expert on the law by the way, but it, the, you we have a tradition from Magna Carta to um, Lex Rex, the law is king. Um, just a, a general view of legislators today, do they really see it in, in, in that light or are they more you know, radical campaigners, let's say? Well, uh, the, the rule of law as I understand it in relation to our country uh, is that uh, the law as it is must be observed and preserved and enforced so far as possible. But of course it can be changed, uh, and it can be changed by Parliament. And therefore, even if a judgment is given, say in the High Court or even in the Supreme Court, uh, the law of England or the, or the law of Scotland, uh, if it happens to be something that's reserved to the UK Parliament, can be uh, altered by the UK Parliament and Scotland and in the other uh, areas, it may be possible uh, for that to happen, for example, by the, Scot by the rules of the Scottish Parliament. But uh, so long as the law remains the same, then it's enforced according to its terms. Uh, the uh, new development of more recent years has been the position in relation to the European uh, Human Rights Convention because there we have bound ourselves by treaty to observe the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg if they arise in a judgment from a case coming from the United Kingdom. We're not obliged to follow cases that were dealt with in relation to France or Germany or Turkey or anywhere else, but if the case comes from the United Kingdom, the terms of the treaty require us to give effect to that uh, ruling. Now, that means that the Parliament of the United Kingdom can't of itself alter that particular ruling. Uh, it has to consider altering the law to conform with that ruling. But as a country, we have a treaty obligation to do so. And that's something that is becoming quite difficult to become accustomed to for parliamentarians. And it's a question, as you have seen, of quite a lot of discussion about various judgments from Strasbourg, which the Parliament of the United Kingdom are having difficulty with. And uh, there seems to be some topics where there's a consensus across the Western world, you know, um, on what Christians might be concerned about. And returning to my earlier question about the challenges that you face as a Christian, what challenges do you see people, Christians in the legal profession today facing? Well, I think there are challenges for Christians uh, in the, the legal profession and indeed in the country, as there always has been. Uh, there have always been challenges, but uh, I think in some ways they are more acute um, in recent times. Uh, coming 
principally from uh, the equality concepts and equality legislation uh, and uh, treating equality as if it meant identity. Uh, and I think that is a challenge for Christians and challenge for other people as well. Uh, and I think uh, one of the techniques that Parliament has adopted uh, in dealing with these matters is to allow free votes. And if the votes are genuinely free, uh, then it's by their consciences that the MPs uh, and also members of the House of Lords, if they have a free vote, decide the issues. Last question, and picking up on that last point about uh, conscience. Um, you, 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 you have um, spoken of this in the past, it, the importance of freedom of conscience. Could you, um, in, as a final uh, answer, uh, to say why that's so important for a free society? Well, I think it's extremely important that people should have a conscience by which they live uh, and that uh, they seek to have that conscience instructed uh, by sound principles. The late Lord Lane, when he was Lord Chief Justice, said in my hearing one of the first speeches in the Lords I heard from him that I think it was the psychiatrist he blamed for doing away with conscience, but he said they haven't managed to invent anything as a substitute. Uh, and I think conscience is a very important uh, aspect of human responsibility, individual human responsibility. Uh, and we allowed it as a defense for going to military service in two world wars when our country was under great pressure. If you had a conscientious objection to serving with the military, a, a, a genuine conscientious objection to serving with the military, you were uh, allowed to go to some other occupation in the help of the war effort, but not the military. Now, in recent times, there have been conscience clauses in some legislation, for example, in relation to abortion, but uh, in the equality legislation, they have uh, uh, always uh, outlawed it. And uh, that challenge is a, quite a considerable challenge for Christians at the present time. There are many others, but that's a considerable one. Lord Mackay, thank you very much for your time. And thank you also to you, our audience, and a reminder that you can see the answers to these questions on the focalonline.org website, focl -online 